So how do we actually get better at endurance exercise? Let's talk about it. I'll see you inside. So in order to really understand how we adapt to endurance exercise, it's important to understand why we adapt to endurance exercise. And what I mean is that in order to cause an adaptation, we must first put the body under a degree of stress. Meaning there must be something about endurance exercise that causes this adaptive process to occur. So the reason we actually adapt to something is because we engage in a specific behavior the body doesn't currently feel it can comfortably handle. At least not with the machinery it currently has in place. Which signals to make a change that gives us a better ability to do this behavior in the future. And in the case of endurance exercise, this would come in the form of getting better at supplying energy to the working muscles, creating energy in the working muscles, and removing the byproducts of metabolism that could inhibit the production of energy in a working muscle. So if we look at energy, at the extremes of low blood glucose, you would actually pass out. And the reason for this is because glucose is actually required inside of the brain. And the brain will simply shut down your muscular system in order to preserve glucose for the cells in the brain that require it. So the supply of blood glucose to the brain certainly is one thing that could be holding us back from increasing our endurance capabilities. And now glucose is going to be stored inside of the muscle and inside of the liver. And the reason that the brain will actually inhibit us from continuing with exercise may not actually be because we have run out of muscle glycogen, because we do still have this liver glycogen available. However, once the liver has no glycogen left, the glucose for the brain begins to run low. And this is when the brain will inhibit us from continuing to exercise and at its most extreme will actually cause us to pass out. So one of the adaptations to endurance exercise is actually a greater ability to spare glucose for the brain. And this is in the form of becoming more efficient at oxidizing fatty acids to fuel our endurance exercise. So if we look at fatty acids, there's a reason that we actually don't use fatty acids to provide energy for all of our exercise. And it's simply because fatty acids are actually quite slow. Initially, I mentioned that glycogen is stored in the liver and in the muscles, but fatty acids are typically only stored in the fat tissue. Therefore, we first must go through what's referred to as mobilization, where we actually chop up these little fatty acids out of our fat tissue and transport them to where they need to be to create energy. Additionally, in order to use these fatty acids, we must completely go through the process of oxidation. And now the first barrier to this is that this process will require oxygen. So if we're trying to create more energy than we can supply with oxygen, we'll have to turn to a different fuel source. And this will occur during something that is higher intensity. In addition, the process of going through oxidation can oftentimes be quite slow. But typically, if we're doing endurance training at a lower intensity, we aren't in need of an abundance of energy all at once. So we have enough time to create energy through the oxidation of body fat. But in a state in which we need more energy than we can supply with oxygen, which is necessary to completely go through the Krebs cycle and produce a lot of ATP, we switch to something called anaerobic respiration which actually is not dependent on oxygen, however it does have some limitations. First of all, it doesn't produce nearly as much energy in the form of ATP because we don't fully go through the process of oxidizing glucose. Instead, we very quickly produce small amounts of ATP and produce the byproduct of lactic acid. And lactic acid is actually acidic, which will reduce the pH of the cell. And this is important because there are specific enzymes in the cells that only function when the pH is above a certain level. So when the acidity of the muscle cell increases from this anaerobic respiration, it will actually decrease the pH and inhibit the function of these enzymes. And now this process will really kick in when we're trying to do something like a sprint finish or an extremely high intensity interval. And you'll know when this process is occurring because your muscles will begin to burn. And because this process is occurring, this is why you can't 
maintain something like a sprint as long as you can maintain a slow jog. This anaerobic metabolism is very finite. And as I mentioned, this process requires glucose. And this is where endurance adaptation number one comes in, which is increasing what's referred to as our anaerobic threshold. And this is simply the threshold at which we begin this anaerobic respiration process. The longer we can stay in what's referred to as our aerobic threshold, or the process where we are fully going through glucose and fatty acid oxidation, the longer we can continue to exercise without running into things like having too much acidity build up inside of the muscle. And the reason we can do this is because there is an upregulation in enzymes and mitochondria within the muscle. And now these aren't the only reasons, but I will discuss the other reasons in a moment. And these are the enzymes responsible for turning glucose and fatty acids into energy. And now there will be an increase in the enzymes responsible for this anaerobic respiration, but a lot of them will actually be responsible for the aerobic process of completely metabolizing glucose and fatty acids. And specifically for endurance, we may actually have a greater upregulation of the enzymes that work with fatty acids. And the reason for this is because the more fatty acids we can use for energy, the less glucose we'll have to use and the more that we can spare for the brain. And the more that we can actually spare for this anaerobic process that can only use glucose. And then we'll also increase the amount of mitochondria because the enzymes are kind of useless if we don't have enough mitochondria because this is simply where the energy is created. And now all of this is good and well, we can now create more energy inside of the muscle, but now we actually need to get more energy to the muscle and make sure that we have the ability to clear the metabolic byproducts out of the muscle quickly enough. And this is where the next adaptation comes in, and it's actually improving blood flow to the muscle by increasing what are referred to as capillaries. And this is the way that nutrient and oxygen-rich blood can enter the muscle tissue, and deoxygenated blood can leave the muscle tissue. And then this deoxygenated blood is taken back to the heart and reoxygenated, and we go through this cycle once again. And since endurance is more about time and less about speed, it's not necessarily about how quickly we can create energy, it's more about how long we can create energy. And as I mentioned, during these lower intensity endurance type activities, we'll have enough time to supply enough oxygen to fully metabolize things like glucose and fatty acids using aerobic respiration. This is going to create more energy inside of the muscle, however, it's simply going to take a little bit longer. But something like low intensity endurance training doesn't require an abundance of energy all at once. And once again, this process requires oxygen, therefore we're definitely going to have to get more oxygen to the muscle. Along with being able to get more nutrients to actually turn into energy. So endurance exercise actually seems to increase the quantity of red blood cells and the quantity of blood inside of our body. And our red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen. And they make up between 40 and 50% of our entire blood volume. And the rest of our blood volume is made up of plasma, which is about 90% water and 10% nutrients. And it's pretty important that we don't just increase the amount of red blood cells that we have. So when we increase the amount of red blood cells that we have, this will make our blood thicker and more viscous and less like a liquid. Conversely, when we increase the amount of plasma we have, the blood becomes thinner and more like a liquid. And thicker blood will actually make it more difficult to pump blood efficiently around the body. So we definitely want the adaptation of more red blood cells to have more oxygen, but we'll also want to simultaneously increase our plasma so we don't thicken the blood. So one of the responses to exercise is actually an increased blood volume and an increased red blood cell count. We can also increase what's called our stroke volume, and this is simply just pushing out more blood from the heart per contraction. So we now have more blood, more oxygen in our blood, and a better ability to get it to the muscle at a quicker speed. And the way we actually increase our stroke volume is interesting. We basically make the heart larger and much stronger. So the left ventricle, which is the portion of the heart responsible for squeezing the blood carrying oxygen, 
is much stronger and contracts much more forcefully and pushes more blood out every time it So we have now improved our ability to get blood to the muscle and it appears that the quality of our blood seems to have improved. But now the muscle actually has to do something with it and this is when we decide to increase muscle capillarization. And you can almost think of this like increasing the amount of pathways and increasing the efficiency of the pathways that the blood can actually get into and out of the muscle. So this increases the amount of oxygen and nutrients we can derive from the blood and increases the speed at which we get this blood back to the heart. And now in terms of oxygen, this is oftentimes referred to as our VO2 max. And the VO2 max is how much oxygen the muscle can consume while we are exercising. And there are technically two mechanisms we can do this. So let's take an example and say that when the blood enters the muscle, it's at 100% saturation of oxygen. And then the muscle will pull about 50% of that oxygen, and the other 50% will leave the muscle through the veins and go back to the heart. One of the adaptations to exercise increasing our VO2 max would be that the muscle can now actually extract about 60% of the oxygen. So for the same amount of blood, we can actually remove more of the oxygen. And this would simply occur because we are making more energy, so we need more oxygen. And this would be a result of all the processes we discussed earlier, such as increasing the enzymes and increasing the mitochondria. And now the other way we would increase this VO2 max, or the amount of oxygen that the muscle can uptake, is by increasing the amount of blood and oxygen going into the muscle per unit time. And as we discussed earlier, because of a stronger heart and more oxygen inside of the blood, we will actually be getting more oxygen to the muscle per unit time. So even if we still actually extract 50% of the oxygen from the blood, because there is more oxygen in the blood in the first place, we have now actually taken out more oxygen. So this will also increase our VO2 max. And now there are an abundance of other adaptations that occur to endurance exercise. Some include psychological mechanisms that allow us to push past our pain thresholds. And others may actually occur at the level of the gut where we can actually absorb more nutrients and have less gut distress during an exercise session, therefore supplying the muscle with more energy which would just be a byproduct of absorbing more nutrients into the bloodstream before, during, and after an endurance training session. However, these are the adaptations that really seem to be the most uniform and common. And while your diet won't necessarily make you better at endurance training, it can impact actually some of the adaptations you get. Beyond making sure that your diet contains sufficient micronutrients and overall energy intake, so that you can provide the muscles with the energy and recover once the exercise session is over. The specific macronutrient ratio that you consume can actually impact some of the adaptations that your body will make. So the body is an efficiency machine and it will make the enzymes that will metabolize the fuel that is most abundant in the environment. And for most endurance athletes taking the high carbohydrate Gatorade approach, you can become extremely efficient at using glucose for fuel during exercise. But if you're doing long endurance exercise, this could mean that you're going to need to actually refuel during exercise, such as eating and drinking solutions with glucose. So another adaptation that these type of athletes may make is actually at the digestive level. And this is a concept called training the gut, where you actually teach yourself to better absorb nutrients during exercise by exercising and eating at the same time during training. At the beginning, this can actually cause a lot of digestive distress, but it appears that there are some mechanisms that this can adapt and you can absorb more nutrients that you ingest during a workout. So with this approach, as long as you have the fuel around during exercise, you won't have an issue supplying glucose to the muscle and the brain. However, this approach can come with some risks because if you don't get in enough energy, you put yourself at risk of the brain shutting down the muscles and stopping the endurance exercise. And this is because we simply have a finite amount of glucose that we can store in the muscle, in the liver, and in the bloodstream. 
With that being said, even the leanest endurance athletes will have days worth of energy stored on their body in the form of body fat. And as I mentioned, you simply can't use fat at the highest intensities, but at low intensities of endurance training, you can actually use body fat and even ingested fat to fuel your endurance running and all other endurance activities. And then you only need a very minimal amount of glucose, which you can obtain during really any period of the day to fuel both the brain and any moments of maximal intensity in which you'll go into this anaerobic respiration process. And it appears that using things like a higher fat diet or actually doing endurance training in a fasted state in which your glucose availability will be low there may be a larger upregulation in the enzymes that are specifically required for using fat as an energy source. And there may also be an upregulation in enzymes required for gluconeogenesis. Because if hypothetically you do not have any glucose around, your body can actually create new glucose using amino acids, the lactate that you will be producing during exercise, and a specific component of your body fat called glycerol that actually holds the fatty acids. So once again, being better at actually using these fatty acids allows you to spare glucose for when you actually need it, and where you actually need it, and you actually upregulate your ability to create glucose. So I think I'm going to leave this one here because I don't want to ramble on too much longer. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you learned just how elegant your body is and all of the amazing ways that we respond and adapt to exercise. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back to listen to the next episode.